very much if any of us have seen or heard England manager Ron Greenwood in this frank, relaxed mood as he talks with Jimmy Hill. Ron, you know more about England's real chances in the World Cup than anybody else. Exactly what are your feelings? I suppose really what it boils down to is the fact that we're there for the first time for a long time. I think that's important. I think we're all aware and very glad that we're there. Secondly, I think that a lot of these players will never get at the opportunity of being involved in another World Cup. It's their last platform that they're going to have at world level. They'll want to make an impression which will leave a lasting impression about their ability. And first and foremost, we've got to make sure that we get into that second round. And if we do that, well then I think anything's open for grabs. You get two games in that second round and anything can happen then. It's like two cup ties, isn't it, really? So consequently, you've got to be prepared for that. And I think we, within the squad, when we talk about England at the moment, I talk about a squad of players, don't talk about a team. And within that squad, like we showed the other day against Northern Ireland, we've got a lot of young players who are knocking at the door. And it's a blend of that youth and experience that's going to be important, I think, to us in the World Cup. So I'm not saying anybody's going to be there, but obviously the idea is to blend that youth and experience together. Being very honest, do you think there is a gap in ability uh, and skill between, shall we say, the best four teams in the competition and England? Or do you think that we honestly are as good as them man for man and collectively? Well, that, that's a dangerous thing to say because we've, we, we've had competition. Well, we, we've had games against Argentina, we've had games against Brazil, and we've had games against West Germany during my period of time. Now, it can be said they were friendly games, right? But we beat Argentina. We, we were most unfortunate in Germany on their own ground and of course the Brazilian game we were murdered for about half an hour and uh, had a very young side out and we were uh, defeated one nought as you know. We did better than any of the France and Germany who played them on that tour. When you look at them, at their skill and their finesse and everything about them, the way they played, the fluid approach about their game, it was, it was enlightening and it was frightening almost. We envy the Brazilians all that, but they envy us this quality that we've got. This resilience that we have, which our characteristic, which is other people envy us that. If we can hit the form which some of our players have got and are capable of showing, then I think we've got as good a chance as anyone. But it's a question of what happens in that 90 minutes, and everybody's got to be in the right frame of mind. My whole philosophy has been based on a combination of what I think is the best of British and the best of the continent. I think it's ideal if you can marry those two qualities together. Keeper, this is Trevor Brooking. Oh, there's a chance there to go. We've got to apply what we're doing week in and week out, and that is our strength and competitiveness, which everybody envies us. Supposing England doesn't come off in the World Cup, and you know yourself because you've experienced a little bit of we'll it. We just have a few more bad headlines. Actually. Well, you've had the bad headlines, yeah, uh, sure. uh, dramatically bad, which stayed in your memory. You mm -hmm. know that. Would that? sour your life if they attacked you and savaged you again? No, I don't think so, because I know in my heart of hearts that I'd have done my best to what we could do, and I'm sure the players will have done their best. And if something happens uh, dramatically like that, and, and, uh, and it's, uh, you have to be realistic, it could happen, it won't have been for the want of trying to. You know, it's not our divine right to win every game, but at the same time, that's what everybody wants to do, and we want to do that. But if the other team are better than you, you have to accept that. We've got to make sure they're not better than us on the day. There was a story that, uh, in some kind of disillusionment, that you did say to the players that you were going to uh, retire, I use that word, rather than resign, mm. and that they talked you out of it. Was that true? Well, it was, it was uh, a bit emotional after we came back from Hungary and, and I just felt that uh, it had been a bit critical and we, we'd weathered the storm and uh, I said to my chairman, Mr. Rag, that I felt that we were going to qualify now for the World Cup, no, no way, no, no problems, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was uh, with the two games to come against Norway and Hungary. I said, there's no problem, you're going to qualify for the World Cup. So why not, I'll move over, I'll, re I'll retire. And I meant retire, I didn't resign. I've never resigned in my life, I don't give in. But I was retiring because uh, it was that, that was the age that I felt was right. 
and uh, so I just told the players and uh, and unfortunately they're very annoyed that it's ever leaked out because very few people knew about it and uh, I don't know how it leaked out but they were annoyed not I wasn't too annoyed so much but they were annoyed because they felt it was a private thing between them and I and uh, there's a there's a kind of deep trust that we have which we've built up which I'm proud of and, and I'm proud of them and uh, they were very hurt when it came out that it had happened but uh, yes in a sense it was true and I was I was uh, I was I was a bit touched in as much that I felt that they still wanted they said we'd all started to go to the World Cup let's finish it that was how they put it so we said okay let's have a go are you glad now that you changed your mind uh, yes but I never do things like that. I always do things because I do things not for myself, but I've always done things in my life, I think, for the sake of football, because football's been very good to me, and I have no illusions about the fact that it's anything to do with me. I just want English football, British football, to be the best in the world, and if I can contribute to, to that aim or that end, in no matter what I do, well, then I feel I, I've contributed successfully. For Ron's contribution to the game already, he was awarded a CBE by Her Majesty the Queen. The occasion shared with his wife Lucy and children Neil and Carol. Ron and Lucy met when he was in the RAF and as was normal in those days, uniforms dominated the wedding photograph. It was cheaper. But 40 years later, their relationship has proved priceless. Lucy and I like to be together and we like walking. We go up on the downs and it's lovely there, you know, and we like to read a lot. And we play cards a lot. We've got quite a circle of friends, and they're not football people, and that's a delight, you know, because they never mention football, is it? <laughs> uh, anyway, we've never talked about football indoors, but basically it's a relief to get away from it, and you don't want to be talking about it all your life. It, it's always in your mind. It's very much a lonely job, really. Yeah. I remember somebody said to me in Hong Kong, do you have to answer to anybody? Yeah. And I thought for a while, and I said, no, not really. No. And then I thought again, and I said, except the nation. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time... We know you ended up England team manager. Could you tell us now where it started, where you were born, how you got into the game? Oh dear, that's a long way back. <laughs> I used to have a Lancashire accent. But yeah, I started in Burnley. My parents eventually moved south during the recession and so I came south when I was about 10 years of age but not before I'd been involved in football in the local village just outside. I was a mascot for the local mill team on the Burnley Turf Moor. The village where we lived was above Burnley and we used to walk down the village two and three quarter miles to see the game you know and uh, that's my early recollection of football. I don't know they're born these days do they? They were lovely days I think and I think you know I mean I was very lucky and it was a village and I was always involved in just playing football daily almost. Wear, I used to wear clogs, used to wear them out. I used to have a local uh, contract with a local clogger the, the, to put irons on the bottom because I was always wearing them out. You know, I was the bane of my mum's life. Actually. Then you came to London, Alperton, mm -hmm. and you had a sort of passport to Wembley Stadium because your dad had a job there, didn't he? I actually worked at Wembley Stadium before my father. It was during a period of time that my father uh, changed jobs that he eventually became and worked at Wembley, but I had already been working there for the firm of uh, sign writers. I was an apprentice, as you know, mm. uh, to sign and glass writing. Very important glass writing. <laughs> and, uh, and we used to do all the exhibition work at uh, Olympia and Earl's Court. And of course they had the contract to do all the work at Wembley Stadium. Well, I wasn't considered fast enough or good enough to do it for the Big Cup final. I used to get the Rugby League Cup final and then I, I eventually <laughs> graduated. I graduated to the, to the Cup final. And I always remember the famous one where I was involved was the Much and uh, Preston, Preston and other things. Yeah, yeah. I'm right up on the scoreboard watching the penalty and all I'm worried about, and I've got to get down off this platform all through the crowd and get down to play at 6.30 for <laughs> Alfredton Boys Club, the club I helped form, to play in a cup final down at Blessier Sports, mm. just behind where we lived in Alfredton. Mm. Ron's professional career started at Chelsea and via clubs like Belfast Celtic, Hull City, Bradford Park Avenue and Brentford, he returned to Chelsea to win a league championship medal with them. While at Brentford, when I first met Ron, we were chosen for a London FA team. He became Brentford's captain in days when coaching was a dirty word. It was said players either could play or they couldn't. But some of us felt there must be more to it than that. If you remember, our goalkeeper was Ted Gaskell who was then a staff coach at the Football Association. And the year before, Jackie Goodwin had been on a course with Ted at the Birmingham University. 
uh, and they were always on about this course and we used to listen to them and say, oh, we'll have a bit of that, you and I, Johnny Payton. And so that year we all, uh, we all entered and put our names down for the first course that was ever held at Lillis Hall, if you remember. So the three of us went, didn't we? And that's how it all started. And uh, I well remember I owed a, a great debt to people like George Ainsley, who were the staff instructors and people like that. And uh, uh, I won't remind people, but I got my badge. You didn't. Uh, you had to wait. <laughs> you mean you were reminding people? <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky, wasn't I? Uh, and then uh, that's when it started. And I think uh, I think it. I mean, it all made an impression on us. And that's when we met Walter Winterbottom. And I think he had a great influence on both your career and my career. And it was nice to meet people like that who who, uh, who gave you belief. And and the whole world of football opened up, and you found out what was happening all over the world. The inspiration of Walter Winterbottom got us coaching in the early 1950s and then we saw the Hungarians. Yeah, that was quite a day, wasn't it? They'd been together for almost three years, that team, and they'd played in the Olympic Games. I remember a lovely tale which has been talked about many times. Puskas was warm enough in the, in the uh, greyhound track round the back where they had a bit of green grass and there was nowhere to warm up and Puskas is out there and they're all training and Jimmy Andrews said to Malcolm Ice, he said, look at that little fat fellow, he said, we'll murder this lot, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an impression, and then if you remember, I was only talking to somebody the other day when Puskas came out and tossed out the coin, he picked the ball up and fiddled about with it, which was nothing strange, but nobody's ever seen anybody do that, and everybody thought, hello, what's happening here? At that time, I, I somehow knew there was more about football than just running around a track, you know? And watching them that day uh, epitomised to me what I felt football was all about. It was to do with thought, it was to do with movement. and the passing was so precise and the shooting and everything but I don't think people saw what was happening off the ball they're only seeing people on the ball and they could see big triangles and then it, English football went through a stage of you know where the triangles were stationary and the art of football is to move triangles about you know and keep them going and that's that's what they did that day a great influence on me and I remember I thought that's the way that's the way the game should be played and to I've been a, an England manager now four years and we've beaten them three times, you know. In the light-hearted days of military music, full grounds and no hooliganism, football had a smile on its face. Greenwood, now manager of West Ham, was given the chance to put his philosophies into practice. It's a family club and to me, uh, they're an example for any club to follow and uh, never in real trouble money-wise because they get the money through the turnstiles as it should be. They entertain the public. What I used to call the floaters of London would come to West Ham to see a game regardless of who won. Uh, sometimes it was the op op opposing team but they didn't matter because they saw a good game. And I think that's the reputation they built up and uh, obviously in this day and age where materialistic things are a bit more of greater value and everybody's got to be identified with success. Perhaps there is a more sterner attitude where we've got to win, we've got to win. But I still think the philosophy's right at West Ham. Football's becoming too mundane, where it, it's too predictable. Every, every match you watch is similar, you know. Get some new ideas going, get people thinking about it, and get rid of the fear in football. And at the same time, entertain the public, because I think that's what we're all concerned about. Get them back, get them excited about the game. But lower down, at a lower, uh, the one thing I have said, and, I, and, I, and I, it would take a long time to explain, but literally what I've said, I would like to see in the developing areas, people playing what I call man-for-man -man football, whereby I'm constantly having to dribble past you, you're constantly having to stop me, and you're, or vice versa. Now, you're, there's two facets in football. Football's a very simple game. There are two facets. You have the ball or you don't have the ball. Now, you've got to be able to cope with those two facets. Now, man-to-man -man football at an early age, I'm not talking about tactics, I'm just talking about man-for-man, -man, where you're in constant 
contact all the time with somebody, trying to beat somebody. Once you've beaten him, now you can run with the ball because there's space to run. It, it's, it's helping, by, by, by example, it's, it's helping to develop the right habits. Now, later on when they grow up, well then you can, you can talk about tactics and that. But you see what's happening at football clubs now and at schools. I mean, kids of eight and nine are being talked to about tactics and whatever. Well, there's more tactics taught at that level than there is when we play an international game. You talk about man-to-man, -man, that was how it used to happen in the playground in the streets with a tennis ball, wasn't exactly, it? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, you see, they're not practicing as, as, as we accept, you know, because there's other things in the different, they grow up differently. But when they play, and they all like to play, well, create within the playing of what you're doing a situation whereby that they're having to practice. And this is where your small-sided games will come in because there's constant contact all the time. Five against five, seven against seven, whatever. You still have goals and either end, still have your goalkeepers. But there's a constant repetition of, of this thing that we're talking about. I'm having to beat you, you're having to stop me, you're having to beat me, and I'm having to stop you. So we're learning what the game of football is all about. And you don't need any teaching, you don't need any advice from the touchline to do that. Just leave them alone and let them play. I think winning football and entertaining football is about scoring goals and uh, if you score more goals than the other team, well, one more goal, that's all you need to do. And I think that should be the object of the game. The, that's what the goals are there for, that's what they were made for, you know, you're supposed to put the ball in the net. I remember the dear old Jackie Anderson who played for us at, at Arsenal, he used to say, well, if you don't know what to do with it, put it in the onion bag out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are a few minutes left, and most of them are going to be in Spain uh, this summer. Really, how do you evaluate England's chances? Honestly, never mind the things you have to say as England's manager. I think, I think we've got a chance if we get over that first hurdle. The most crucial game is going to be our game against France. If we can come out of that with a victory, then I think we've got a chance to certainly get in the second section, having done that. And then the second section is a knockout competition, really, in my eyes. I think that's when the World Cup really starts. Twelve best teams in the world playing each other. There's no question of... You've got to win that section to go into the semi-final. It isn't a question of saying, well, we've finished second or... Well, you've got to win both your games, and that, that'll be when the crunch comes. And I would like to think, uh, as I've said many times, that what happens in the World Cup this year is going to be revitalising football all over the world. Everybody's suffering, you know about crowds and different things like that. And I think what we want to do, we, and television is a media that we're talking about, we want to relay all over the world the type of football that I think the fans want to see. And I'd